We're counting down the, the hours to the caucus begins. They start around 7 o'clock. And according to the latest polls, the Texas Congressman Ron Paul has a very strong chance to take Iowa. Even if Congressman Paul... Well, you know what they say, broken clocks are right twice a day and blind hogs do occasionally find acorns and truffles. And uh, there's uh, Shepard Smith of Fox News pointing out that early trends uh, from the latest polls show that Ron Paul should handily win the Iowa caucuses. Now, they've just started the voting at the precincts, and then it has to be tabulated at that secret location because anonymous hackers have threatened to disrupt it. And I saw it reported today that the uh, fellow who's been uh, out protesting in front of Ron Paul's offices in Iowa with Anonymous uh, is reportedly the person that uploaded the video uh, of Anonymous uh, saying that hackers were going to go after it. So you can see who the system is definitely upset about. The Drudge Report is linked to our article, Tonight's Iowa Vote Count to Take Place at Secret Location. Continuing, concerns about supervision grow after Republican strategist says GOP establishment will not allow Ron Paul to win. We're going to break some more of this down, and then we're going to have constitutional lawyer Timothy Baldwin joining us to talk about election 2012, or the attack on states' rights, and more. That is coming up. So there's that report. Concerns about uh, subversion grow after Republican strategist says GOP establishment will not allow Ron Paul to win. And uh, we have the full clip of the strategist, uh, who's a frequent guest on Fox News, telling uh, Iowa Radio this. Uh, and uh, it's not clear if she's saying they're not going to let him win by influencing people or something else, but they sound very confident uh, that Ron Paul is not going to be allowed to win. Uh, in fact, uh, here's the article, and we've got part of the transcript here. Republican insider GOP establishment planning to subvert Iowa to prevent Ron Paul win. Now, I had Ron Paul's brother, who's another great patriot, anti-Federal Reserve activist, on today, and he sent it to top folks in the campaign, and they said no. We're aware of these reports, and people are saying this, I and mean, we're reporting on what they're saying, but uh, we've got people everywhere, and it looks like that this process is going to be fair. So let's hope that that's the case. We'll know more tomorrow in the aftermath of this, because they're, they're now doing the voting, but it's got to be sent to that secret location, and I guess finagled for a while until we find out uh, exactly what happened. McBreen has an interesting theory, one of our reporters, and, and that's that they know he's probably got a 20-point lead as some real on the street polls are showing. And so they, they just want people to know that he's such a front runner, but they know they can't steal it because it's too obvious, so they might have him win by one point or something. We're going to find out, maybe even by the end of the show tonight. Uh, continuing, the host of the show refers to the state GOP insiders showing great concern that Ron Paul is performing well in Iowa because they fear Ron Paul win would undermine Iowa's position as being the first Republican primary. Oh, it undermines it if people vote for him, implying Ron Paul's undermining the state. He implies that influential members of the Republican establishment within the state are offering sweetheart deals to prominent voting blocks in key swing districts in order to sway the result and ensure Ron Paul doesn't win. Uh, and uh, it goes on uh, with the D.D. Benke uh, saying, is it possible that the party apparatus here could be silently acting and asking those district chairmen to start swaying some important caucus members over the anti-Paul uh, end, which may end up being Santorum? Do you see a scenario like that happening? He asked her. And then she said, I've talked to party officials. I know they're concerned about it said Binky, adding that Ron Paul doesn't do us any good in Iowa, doesn't do our country any good, and never get there, so let's figure out what we can do. And then it goes on to talk about the party officials swaying people not to vote for him. Uh, so this could be seen either way, but uh, we're going to continue to track that um, this evening. Uh, continuing, uh, there's another article by Kurt Nemo breaking this down, Transparent Vote, Countering the Establishment Monopoly on Vote Reporting. Uh, and there's different organizations like Transparent Vote that are asking people at all of the locations uh, to demand to see the local precinct tally and to have it posted as it's legally supposed to be and not called in to the, quote, secret uh, location. So that the, quote, national election pool... I guess that's tied into voter news services can uh, basically tell us whatever they want. 
Uh, continuing here with the Ron Paul news, Sam Torum lashes out at Ron Paul, calls Iowa frontrunner disgusting. And Santorum has also broken down crying, talking about children, lots of other desperate little staged events from the uh, neocon. Uh, there's, there's really no end to the things that they'll do, calling somebody who's simply a constitutionalist disgusting. But I guess as George Orwell said, telling the truth in a world of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. Uh, shifting gears, there's an article here out of the Telegraph today, children becoming addicted to computers. Well, that's true. And children in all the big studies are also addicted to television. But they're really going after computers because at least there it's interactive and isn't just 10 or 15 flavors of globalist propaganda. They might actually run into some truth online. And so that's why the system is so concerned about the Internet, because it's supplanting them. Um, in fact, I've never seen my children get the same zombie-like stare being on the computer in, doing interactive learning or researching of something they're doing uh, than when they actually are allowed to watch television and you can't get their attention. Uh, so there is uh, that report. And uh, here's another report uh, out of CBS News. Uh, Charlton Library sends police to collect overdue books from a five-year-old. I've seen cases in Williamson County just north of Austin where if a video is a day overdue, they come and arrest you and charge you with theft in one case from the Hollywood video that was up there a few years ago. Of course, that was back when they still had video stores. Now everything's gone to Redbox. Uh, but it just shows this throw the book at, 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 at petty criminals or people that aren't even criminals, but then let MF Global steal a billion plus dollars because it's politically collect, uh, connected, give 16 plus trillion to the private Federal Reserve to give to private individuals, and then have no discussion about where the money went, even when Ben Bernanke gets caught lying about it. Uh, now, uh, continuing uh, with the CBS piece, here's a short clip where the police officer says, yeah, it does seem like an overreaction, but I'm just following orders. Where did we hear that before? Nobody wanted to, on this end, get involved in it, but the library contacted us and the chief delegate, and apparently I was one of the low men on the totem pole. But state law does outline a misdemeanor for such things, and police thought a friendly reminder might make a better impression and get better results than a cold summons to court. The library director knew she'd get flack over this, but... If something seems overblown, it is. Use some discretion, police. If you don't have better things to do and real criminals to go after, perhaps your police department could be downsized. After all, we're in a depression here. But see, police can only revenue generate now in many cases. They can't actually help the people. And that's because we're going into this austerity predatory system. I have a, another uh, report here. This is out of the London Telegraph as well. At one of the Queen's estates, police uh, examine human remains Residents have expressed shock at the discovery of human remains in the woodland on the estate, the Queen's Country Retreat in Norfolk. You know, they're constantly digging up dead bodies or finding dead bodies on Bush estates around the United States. Uh, they're always finding dead bodies at royal estates. They have a lot of employees. It could be some of them. Uh, but we also have previous reports in the Daily Mail and others about the royal family dining on human flesh just a couple hundred years ago. So there's no idea uh, what these predators have really been up to. Uh, detectives are set to return to the scene Tuesday uh, as they continue to try to establish the identity of the remains. A post-mortem is due to take place. It remains unclear how long the remains have been there, if there is in fact a body or the age uh, of the victim or victims. The dog walker has also not been named. Uh, and they say that the operation has been shrouded in secrecy. And see, that's the problem, because it's the royals that's shrouded in secrecy. Now, there it is. British royalty dined on human flesh. But don't worry, it was 300 years ago. Yeah, right. They say they quit wiping their hind ends 90 years ago or so, but we did research. They still have grooms of the stool. Oh, yes, their defecation is examined, and generally a top lord is there to wipe their bottoms because they're so holy. They dare not have to do it themselves. Mm. <laughs> I mean, look at that. <laughs> uh, uh, mm, trendy. It is just a stone's throw away from Stud and the Royal House. It's very close. Uh, you couldn't get very close to the site. Police said they expected to be there through tomorrow. So there you have it. And there's a nice telling photograph of Witchy Poo, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, 
uh, there on the front of the article. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is it for the news section, and we'll have more for you, obviously, tomorrow when we know more about what happened in Iowa, but it's very exciting to see how much support Ron Paul's getting. Shows that liberty is rising and the tyrants are squirming. We're going to come back with Mr. Baldwin to break down more on the campaign trail and look at the attack on the Tenth Amendment states' rights. Stay with us. It's InfoWars Nightly News. America is in trouble. Washington is a disgrace. Government has become too big. It's overtaxing, overspending. We need to change direction. We really need change. We can't afford to make the same mistakes we've made in the past. Mitt Romney's reputation as a flip-flopper. He went the other way when he got paid to go the other way. There is need for economic stimulus. It's about serial hypocrisy. This election is about trust. There's been one true consistent candidate, and that's Dr. Ron Paul. Ron Paul has been so consistent from the very beginning. He seems like a more honest candidate. He tells the truth about what he believes, whether you like it or not. He's never once voted for a tax increase, never once voted for an unbalanced budget. Ron Paul's plan is bold, cuts five departments. It's what we need. When he says he's going to cut a trillion dollars in the first year, I believe it. If you don't like how things are going and you're tired of politicians, he's something different. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Is the one we've been looking for. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. It was uh, between 1972 and 73, but it was still a lot of prejudice around this area. My wife was sick and I was trying to get some attention for her. Nobody came to check. They just left her there. Well, I believe I was left there because of the difference, uh, me being black and her being white. And every time I would say something to her head nurse, she would get pretty upset. And then she finally called the uh, Freeport Police Department, said I was harassing her. And I mean, I didn't know anything to do. Well, then Ron Paul come to my rescue. He just stepped in and went to work with my wife. And after he seen her, uh, I'd say no more than 10 minutes later, she had a stillborn boy child. And he said, as far as the bill, he would take care of everything, which he did. I never got a bill from the hospital or anything. And he was a doctor of medicine, and that's what he was doing, was practicing medicine, and it didn't matter who and what and why. He was doing it because he think of one human being just as much as another. He's just a honest man, and that's something we need now in this day and time. It's a lot of politics and no honesty. When you have honesty, well, People will try to do anything to blot you out. And that's what they will try to do to him, is blot him out, because he will be honest. And they need more like him. Click here to donate to help get James' story broadcast on television. We're back. It's InfoWars Nightly News, and it's the big caucus night, uh, obviously. Uh, they're in Iowa, and we're going to have all the full results and analysis for you tomorrow. We're going to have uh, the expert on electronic uh, voting machine fraud, uh, Bev Harris, uh, joining us on the radio tomorrow, and then later in the week back here on InfoWars Nightly News. But I wanted to invite a guest from the radio show here on the Nightly News, Timothy Baldwin. Tim Baldwin is a constitutional lawyer, 
Uh, he heads up Liberty Defense League that does a lot of great work. He's also an author. And his father is a, a prominent uh, fighter for uh, Liberty. Of course, that's Chuck Baldwin, the uh, presidential candidate from 2008 for the Constitution Party. And he joins us from Montana to give us his take on uh, what's happening this political season. And uh, obviously the stakes are uh, higher than they've ever been before to defeat this globalist takeover. And there's a, an awakening bigger than anything I've ever seen uh, happening, but I want to get his view from Montana on that as well, Ron Paul, uh, and a lot more. Tim, great to have you with us. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, you heard my intro. Uh, what type of awakening are you seeing? Are you seeing the same explosive awakening uh, that I'm witnessing? Well, I, I think it's uh, many parts, actually, Alex. I think there's there's an explosive awakening uh, to, to some people. And to other, others, I think it's a progressive awakening. Um, either one of them is good. They both should lead to the same result, and that is there's in our country um, from the top down. You're right. Uh, I mean, everybody I talk to, whether it's Ron Paul or your dad, I mean, anybody, they, they're seeing people finally get it. Why do you think the awakening is accelerating? I think it sort of goes to this, uh, this self-preservation, self-defense kind of a mechanism in our in our nature and that is when we start to see things um around us that are uh, causing our our stability to be challenged our uh, the predictability of the future to be questioned those types of factors are in play here because of the economy because of the success we've seen them for so many years um you know people are starting to question the system as a whole and so they're looking around them, they're looking at leaders like Ron Paul, and they're listening to what they're saying and saying, you know, that makes sense. So they start to research, they start to study, they start to listen to, the, to their friends or, or family who are saying these things, and, and, and their minds are convinced. So I, I think it's a, um, just a natural progress. Record gun sales in the month of December, uh, over 1.5 million background checks, and that's only people buying from registered gun dealers. They estimate uh, the average person was buying a little more than two firearms, so that's over 3 million guns. An all-time record of the accelerated sales are just continuing. And I saw some surveys of people uh, why they were buying guns, and the number one reason was uh, collapse of the government, uh, collapse of society, and not trusting uh, the government, civil unrest. I mean, that's a strong vote right there of no confidence for this puppet government. I think it's been going that way for many years, and some people would, um, you know, would claim that that is uh, silly talk. It's uh, paranoia. But you know, when you have such a large consensus um, about what's going on from people who really have no personal agenda, people who are um, business people or professionals or whatever status they might be, uh, they're looking at this from a very objective point of view, and they they don't see stability. They see that there's uh, potentially some very um, troubling times ahead of us. And of course, uh, that self-defense uh, mechanism that we talked about earlier, you know, we, we have to protect ourselves as individuals, uh, uh, protecting our families. And so it's no wonder people are, are uh, loading their shelves with food and stocking ammunition and, and those types of things. They're, they're scared. Well, when you look at the type of globalists we have running our society, that is a reason to be concerned. I mean, these are anti-family, anti-sovereignty, anti-free market crony capitalists who, 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 who want to overthrow our system and bring in a post-industrial world. Um, as a constitutional lawyer, but also talking to your dad, what is your view on why they passed the NDAA, why the system, the tyrants are really more and more coming out of the closet, admitting that they want to have internet censorship, a selective kill switch. I mean, they are really doing our job for us now uh, I mean, the stuff we talk about a decade ago and get laughed at for, it's now all happening. Uh, and the system isn't even trying to hide it a lot now. Well, it's the uh, boiling frog analogy. You know, typically, you know, people who have of sorts, they are not going to lay their agenda out all at one time. They're just, uh, that, that would be foolish of them to do that. It would raise too many flags. The people would, bec would become alarmed. And so they do it incrementally. That's what they've been doing for many years. And so it's just one brick on top of the other. The NDAA is just another brick. If not, it's a cement that holds the brick together. And it is a bill that a lot of people, or it's actually a law now since Obama signed it, uh, that people are very concerned about. Uh, it does, in fact, uh, 
admit or acknowledge or recognize the president as having power to arrest U.S. citizens without uh, judicial warrant, without probable cause, without any judicial re review whatsoever, and they could be held under the laws of war. That is a very dangerous place to be in if you're supposed to be living under a constitutional system of government. Well, you're right. And uh, then it's got all the other provisions about declaring the world a battlefield and then transferring that power to the president. That's really a transfer of a lot of the war powers. Uh, expanding on that, you know, talking to people there in your area of the world and, 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 and to folks that visit your uh, you know, different websites, what is the sense of the population? Uh, I mean, uh, from my perspective, they think the, the, the establishment is just going to go forward, the tyranny is only going to get worse, and that a big confrontation is coming. Uh, what's your view? You know, it's hard to, to say if that's going to happen or not. I know there are a lot of us, including yourself and, and people who are, um, you know, ed trying to educate people um, who hope for hope for political resolution. We hope for, you know, resolution through the political and, and democratic process uh, within a constitutional republic form of government. And we're doing everything we can to uh, lay out the issues, to lay out the calls, of, uh, the, the call to action. Uh, trying to get people to understand where we are, why things are happening way, the way they are. Um, so, there, and that's one of the reasons why so many other people are waking up to what's going on around us. Uh, I think that with the number of people that are awake in 2012, um, the, the, the powers that be would be very foolish to try to force certain things uh, down our throats uh, without consent, because the, rep the repercussions would be, just be uh, too devastating for their agenda and, and because they're, they're accomplishing so much as it is without that sort of force. Um, so I think they're going to continue to do that. But as long as the people become awake and aware of what's going on, they're going to have a difficult time of doing this through political means. Well, you're right. I mean, that's one reason Obama said he would veto the bill, then signed it, then said, well, it does affect citizens, but don't worry, I won't implement it. They don't want to do things completely in the open because it helps us then form a larger and larger political movement that's really awake to what's happening. Uh, watching Congressman Ron Paul and the different dirty tricks they're running, they're not working as well as they did in the past. So now I'm expecting to see uh, more election fraud. I, I know the campaign doesn't like to talk about that because they've made the calculation that then it makes people think, well, why vote? They'll just cheat it anyways. Uh, but we are seeing some evidence of that going on. Uh, overall, what do you think about this Ron Paul phenomenon? Well, he is a movement. You know, Ron Paul is iconic in so many ways because he cuts across the board of party label, across the board of schools of thought. He, he attracts so many different Americans because he stands for this idea of individual liberty, reducing uh, the power of government from the elitist mentality, putting it back into the states, putting it back uh, to the individual where it belongs. And people are very much attracted to that. His movement is one that will not die, Alex, uh, even if he doesn't get elected um, or nominated or, or elected as president. His movement that he started through through much of what he's done in Congress will continue with people like you and me and the people that we are able to influence. So, you know, it's, it's like a, a Star Wars episode where Obi-Wan Kenobi, if he perishes, then Luke Skywalker will take the baton and go forward. And, and that's what's happening right now. Well, we've got sources inside Bilderberg, and going back even to 2006, they're very upset about Ron Paul. And back then, it wasn't because they thought he could even win. It was the fact that the youth aren't getting into fake neocon, warmongering, police state, fake conservatism, and they're not getting into the liberal uh, communism. They're actually getting into Americana constitutionalism. And then by the last time we got intel on this was 2010. Uh, they are freaking out about Ron Paul as a focal point. And as you said, as Ron Paul has said, he is just that, a focal point, And he's using this as a way to educate people. He could win. But even if he doesn't win, we win by being involved. I mean, Ron Paul, 15 years ago in Congress, couldn't get one co-sponsored audit the Fed. Last year, 2011, it passed the House. They procedurally killed it in the Senate and watered it down. But still, we've got to look at this in the balance of, of, of decades, not in days or weeks or months. We are having huge positive uh, effects right now exponentially. My concern is 
How will the globalists that have taken control through fractional reserve banking, their giant global Ponzi schemes, how are they going to strike back? Uh, Tim Baldwin, what's your view on that? Well, they're going to try every method they can. You know, retaining power uh, sometimes can be a very difficult thing when the, the structure itself is starting to shake and starting to tremble. Um, you, you know, if you look around us, especially with the state sovereignty movement, you have people who are who are focusing now on using the states to restore freedom, and I've been a big part of that as well. And it is, in fact, a key focal of the issues at hand. If the if the global bankers cannot control the banking system, the economic and financial system, then back into the hands of the people through their state governments, and the the, the influence that the over the, the entire country and in the entire world, uh, seriously undermined. And so you have people like Chuck Baldwin, who's running as Lieutenant Governor of Montana, along with Bob Fanning, who is the gov governor candidate for Montana. They are strongly advocating that Montana have a state bank that will, um, uh, that the central banking system has created over the years, uh, giving the people of Montana a financial future in prosperity and independence. That's right. Taking the money power away from offshore mega banks who then hand themselves government authority and actually having it under the state government as the Constitution states or the federal government. Expanding on that, now the system is really scared of the states' rights movement. That's why the globalist stage of the Oklahoma City bombing was because of a huge state rights movement centered around Oklahoma City that was growing across the country. Uh, at the time, uh, get us out of the UN, get back to American values, true constitutional conservatism. And so that was staged as the film A Noble Lie exposes uh, to, to be blamed on uh, the uh, liberty movement in this country. But here we are 15, 16, 17 years later, that same old demonization isn't working anymore. And there's this attempt to say there are no states' rights. Well, why until the 17th Amendment in 1913 did the state legislatures who were elected, why did they vote to select the U.S. senator that's now popularly elected? Why do we even have states or jurisdictions? The truth is the Ninth and Tenth Amendment state very, very clearly that, that it is key th to have the states and that they should really, at the end of the day, have more power than the federal government and have a right to even pull out of the federal government uh, if the federal government becomes destructive uh, of their uh, rights and liberties and freedoms and the same for the people. The Ninth Amendment states that, as you know. But we have this idea now of just saying, hey, and, and you wrote an article about this this week that we linked to at Infowars.com, we're hearing more and more, even Republicans come out and say, no, that was decided in the Civil War. The federal government's all powerful. Well, okay, really? Then I guess, you know, Obama is a dictator then. I guess, why do we even have states? Uh, break that down for us. Yeah, the, there's a mentality that has been very prevalent throughout the United States where it, it doesn't matter which political party you're in, Republican, Democrat, or whatever. Within the legal community, I can, I can tell you, since I am in the legal community in the, in, the, in the Bar Association here in Montana, that there is this prevailing idea that, and you're taught this in law school, that federal laws trump state laws, you know, and there's no qualification to that statement. If the federal law has the state law, whatever it might be, is trumped by that federal law. Uh, there is no study and no um, intentful purpose to really give effect to the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment and you see that throughout the attorneys and judges in the country. The article that I wrote was in reference to a, an AG candidate in Montana who's a Republican um, who made some statements while he was sitting as a state senator about the Civil War and, and its effect on the state's rights to interpose against federal usurpation. And uh, he, he actually is in the process of writing an article, which I have not seen yet, so we'll see what his detailed response is. But regardless of his particular view, that is a prevailing view of the Constitution of the United States. It's an incorrect view. If you read the Federalist Papers, as I mentioned in that article and detailed in that article, they were very explicit about the state's right and duty to interpose against federal usurpation. And if we look at that the bill that Obama signed uh, on New Year's Eve, um, you know, this is reason why the state should be paying attention uh, for such reasons as the indefinite detention of U.S. citizens. Well, I mean, look at New Hampshire's right to revolt. It's right there that anytime the state wants to pull out, it can. Texas, 
uh, is the Lone Star State because it, it, it opted in by treaty and can pull out any time it wants. Uh, and it's the only state that entered that way. Uh, I know out west, the, you know, the feds were more powerful then, so some of the some of the ways that those territories were brought in, you know, have a little bit less states' rights. But 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 once you have your states that have rights, those trump those in precedent and travel over to the western states, which in some areas, as you know, are over 85 percent federal land, and they act like you know federal gods harassing the people out there that are few and far between. But this this outrageous idea that Obama can launch a war in Libya and not even consult Congress now. We're seeing an overall war against the Bill of Rights and Constitution and Declaration of Independence, and we see Newsweek saying, get rid of the Constitution. It caused the problems. That's counting on the public's ignorance. That's why it's important we're here stating the facts. We got rid of the Constitution, and that was like the oxygen in the room. All of our prosperity went with it. It's not the Constitution that went wrong. We went wrong by letting tyrants come in and get rid of it. I mean, it, it's so simple what the Ninth and Tenth Amendments say. It's so simple. If you read the Federalist Papers and how the states made up the federal government, it's a creature of them. Uh, and, and the states are a creature of the people. It goes people, states, federal government. But first they said they were co-equal, just like the branches of government. And then now they say, oh, the president's the boss of everything. I mean, it, it's just completely backwards. And, and that's why we're seeing such a resistance uh, throughout the United States, Alex, is, is because um, taught to us over and over and over again. And then when people start to, to study and actually look into the truth of the matter, they, they say, no, that's not right. That's not true. And, and then so education becomes a crucial point of understanding and actually getting things changed. You know, it's funny because when you mentioned you know, the, the makeup of, of the, uh, the the union and how the states uh, enter the union and, and that kind of thing. You know, if you look at even Abraham Lincoln's uh, statements regarding secession, he never denied that secession was a right. He only said that it had to be done through the consent of the states through the union. And so at the very least, Article 5 of the Constitution would provide the states with a method of seceding from the union. So what we had today is even a distortion of what happened in the 1860s, uh, which was never about the right of revolution or the right of secession in general. It was only about the way that the state seceded specifically during that time. Who are holding this view that the Civil War uh, passed to the civil government all of this authority without consent, without constitutional amendment, without due process or anything along those lines. They're, they're stating a very serious flaw, but unfortunately, so many federal politicians have adopted that view and they treat the states and the individuals individuals accordingly. Yeah, they act like they're lords, they're King George the Third, and we're we're the little serfs. But uh, expanding on that, look, I've read what Lincoln said. I've studied the Civil War. It's not hard to find this information. It's not like it's some secret. It's just it's not taught by the so-called mainstream uh, uh, deceptive media. But it had nothing to do with slavery. It was about who would control Western expansion. It was about unfair tariffs. Uh, on the South that didn't affect the North. Uh, and the Lincoln quotes, you can type them into a search engine, Lincoln, I, I would unify the country without you know, freeing one slave. There was very few slaves owned in the South. The institution was being phased out. That is a modern fiction to sell this. Lincoln had hundreds of newspaper owners and editors arrested, members of Congress arrested, a total end of free speech, you know, the dictatorship of Lincoln and Stanton. Then for eight, nine years after the Civil War, I mean, uh, people were murdered and raped and robbed all over the country, even in the West, had nothing to do with slavery, uh, by federal troops, I mean, and, and, and the carpetbagger trains behind them. I, I mean, uh, this was just uh, another great example of pointless tyranny. And now they teach this fable today uh, that the Civil War uh, was about freeing black people. Yeah. And of course, there's there are there's cultural context to the slavery issue in that day, and as you noted, it was on its way out for sure. I mean, the technology that was developing developing at that time was allowing uh, much more production without the use of individuals to do that. So, I mean, it, absolutely, it was on its way out. It was a political uh, issue. It was a matter of uh, control over territories and and uh, you know the states believing that the federal government was not exercising its power for the general welfare. And, and so the, all that's a matter of history. 
even uh, even Abraham Lincoln in his first inaugural address stated the issue pretty clearly. Politicians have adopted this idea that the federal laws um, trump state laws without regard to the Tenth Amendment. It's um, being able to retain sovereignty over the matters they were supposed to re retain sovereignty over. So we've seen over the past 100 years this, this gradual overtake of state sovereignty to the point now where the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, through particularly through Clarence Thomas, questioned this idea of, of the Commerce Clause and, and Congress's ability to regulate uh, the states within the borders where their activity does not uh, affect other states. And, they're, and so they're questioning this long line of FDR stack the courts during his administration. There is a shift. There is a shift of ideology that we're seeing take place. Um, and it's through this uh, natural evolutionary process uh, being able to retain individual liberty for our own self-preservation, self-improvement. Well, sure, but just to be clear, it's it's bad enough to have a tyrannical federal government, but the people that run the federal government today, it's even worse. They're bought and paid for by globalists, by the very mega banks uh, that have created all these global derivatives, and our military is simply there to backstop all that fraudulent paper and to collect off of us debts that are not owed by us. I mean, they're telling us we've got to raise taxes and cut benefits and all this stuff uh, because we owe, you know, $15 trillion. And, and, and I don't agree with the dependency and the $15 trillion, but it's nothing compared to the 60, what was it, 664 million, the Washington Post says, of the global 1.5 quadrillion, 600 plus trillion that we've been signed on to that Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank created in the last 15 years or so, and they've gotten the politicians to sign us on, and now the bought and paid for mouthpieces in the media are telling the public, you owe this money, and the Federal Reserve and the central bankers, they're trying to fix it. They're telling Europeans, we're going to jack your taxes up to pay your debt, and 90 plus percent of the debt isn't theirs. I mean, it's just such a giant fraud. So we've got to, to, to totally discredit this federal government because it's worse than a federal government. It is a occupational command base. Uh, that's, this, why Ron, that's why Ron Paul is so dangerous to their structure, to their platform, to their inter, underpinnings of their system. Uh, Ron Paul under, um, they, they've done a good job over the years of trying to, you know, but, but they're not able to do that much anymore because of the big following that he has and the, just the sense that he makes and the historical knowledge he has regarding all of those things that you just described. And that's another reason why, it, it, on the state level, we have to have governors in place who are willing to uh, sign into law uh, state, state bank um, ordinances that would allow the people of the individual states to become independent of this Federal Reserve monstrosity where uh, Congress and those who control them are controlling uh, the money as they have been and getting us into debt as they have been and diminishing our asset uh, value and the, the depreciation of the dollar itself to the point now where, you know, we're looking around and we're wondering, you know, where's the future? We can't see it. And so we're having to, to go back to our defensible positions. Well, Tim Baldwin, great job. We're going to have to do a part two of the interview with you in the next few weeks, getting into your book, uh, Romans 13, that exposes how the system is uh, using the preachers to tell people to submit to corrupt government when obviously that's not in the Bible. One of the biggest problems we've got is that the churches have been taught to basically bow to tyranny and you've done a great job along with your father doing that. And I also look forward to getting your dad on about uh, his uh, run there in Montana. And uh, where's the best place for people to find the Romans 13 book? Yeah, Alex, they can go to Romans13truth.com. That's Romans13, the number, truth.com. And they can, uh, they can order that from that website. That's wonderful. We'll have to do a whole interview just on that coming up in the near future. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Alex. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Tomorrow, we'll be back with Bev Harris, expert on election fraud. If there was any dirty tricks or uh, chicanery going on. And we've got uh, also some other big guests joining us uh, on the Nightly News tomorrow as well. She'll be joining me on the radio show. So we're going to continue to watch what's happening uh, in the caucuses. Uh, and uh, Drudge throughout the day has been having his own caucus votes, and Ron Paul is the clear leader uh, there. Don't forget, if you believe in this type of information, want to help support it, 
It is you, the subscribers to PrisonPlanet.tv and InfoWarsNews.com that finance uh, this nightly news uh, that is seen by you first on the website and then posted on the web where millions are able to see it each week. And so we appreciate those of you supporting us. If you're a new viewer out there and want to see all of my films and the daily TV show, uh, radio show archived and expanded extras, we've had PrisonPlanet.tv now for close to nine years, and you can sign up for free. We're a 15-day free trial at PrisonPlanet.tv. That's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Great job to the crew, and we'll see you back here tomorrow night. <laughs>